Sonic the Hedgehog is art. Art is everywhere. A banana tapes to a wall? That is art. A man eating the banana? This is also art. The wall has collapsed onto the man? Is this art? No. This is a crime scene. But this artist rendition, ah, now this is art. A video game from 1991. To compete with Nintendo, Sega ditched their mascot Alex Kidd and launched a internal contest of sorts for a new one. One that would finally knock Mario down a peg or two. Several ideas were considered. An armadillo who would later become Mighty the Armadillo. And a rabbit with stretchy ears to grab things that would later go on to star in a game called... Uh... Hey, one chop. So, uh, as the only person in the world who I know actually cares about this, what's the correct pronunciation of this star character? It's Ristar. Oh, okay, Ristar. They wanted a mascot that would be a guaranteed hit in the West, and kids would want to draw. Sega really wanted to create it. It's uh, Sega's Mickey Mouse. So they ripped off Mickey Mouse, stuck the head of Phoenix the Cat on there, made him blue like their logo, gave him sneakers, put a button on it inspired by Michael Jackson, coloured it red and white like Santa Claus, and thus the world was introduced to the icon known as Mr. Needle Mouse. Yep, that's what they called him. Service Games, or Sega for short, started out making coin-operated machines like Pinball before stepping into the video game industry. Arcade games were their bread and buttons. Periscope was one of the earliest examples of this, setting many standards including being the first arcade game to introduce the idea of a quarter per play. This dominance in the arcade market gave the Mega Drive a head start in games with ports such as Altered Beast. But if they were going to fend off the juggernaut that was the impending Super Nintendo, they needed their own Mario. This art is a painting by Mark Rothko. You may have seen paintings like this one. Blocks of colors like these are known as multiform. But what is it a painting of? There's no scenery, there's no royalty, no sexy Jesus. <clears throat> Maybe the title of this will reveal all. Enlightening. Yuji Naka had just ported Ghouls and Ghosts to the Genesis, but yearned to make a game that moved much faster. He noted the uneven terrain, something that Sega could do that Nintendo and wondered what it would be like for a character to run through it, like a ball on a course. He had previously developed an algorithm that allowed sprites to move smoothly on a curve by determining its position with a dot matrix. This prevented the character from breaking through the terrain and allowed them to move much faster than any Nintendo counterpart, which led to advertising like... The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. Sega! And despite even Nintendo's claims, blast processing was an actual thing. Essentially a technique of using the inbuilt processor to expand upon the Mega Drive's color palette. A feature so good, no game ever actually used it. But the name sounded awesome, so advertising executives ran with it to make the Mega Drive seem and cool and edgy and my god it worked let me just take a second to talk about controls this is like my ted talk if everyone left within the first 10 seconds a typical mario game has two button controls one is run and i don't think i've ever played a mario game where i didn't just hold run throughout resulting in a serious case of denty finger the other button is jump you see a hole you jump but what if hole is big aha then we combine the two buttons where we run and then jump when holding the NES controller, your thumb is hovering over one button, which makes it easy to switch over to the next. Or you can hold down one button and easily press the next. Run and jump. Run and jump. But the NES controller wasn't very comfortable to hold. Note the square edges, but just look at the Mega Drive controller. Oh, oh just look at those curves. Oh, filthy. It resembles more of an arcade layout. The buttons are larger and fan away from the thumb. Meaning when you rest on one, you have to reposition to reach the next button. This is fine in arcade games that require one input at a time, or combinations, but Mario wouldn't work on a Mega Drive, as it's way too uncomfortable to press one button and lean onto the next, certainly for an entire game. Next in my presentation, how many Wii controllers I can fit up my- So, what is this a painting of? The real question is, how does this piece make you feel? For some, it may evoke dread, like me being asked to do anything. For others, they may find something tranquil, like me being asked to do anything, but then they say, oh, it's already been sorted out, never mind. Uh, what was the question again? The development team wanted to make a game about gaining and maintaining momentum. Oh, you thought it was about speed? No! My bra. You start off slowly and gradually build speed. The fun is seeing if you can keep up that speed, like a risk-reward thing. 
The levels are built around this concept, with the higher areas made to be risky to reach and to stay up there. The more you replay and practice, the satisfaction in pulling off those massive stunts is greater. Level designer Hirokazu Yashuhara compares this to a kid's slide. Sure, that slide works just fine, but this slide is more fun as it evokes some role playing. But then you can make it bigger, which evokes vertigo, an exhilarating sense of danger. Then add water, which throws in some random chance into the mix and create multiple lanes, which creates competition. And these are the forms of play, what makes a game a game. And it's also why my theme park got shut down. Well, you can't make an omelette without multiple fractured skulls. It's a lot, a lot of kids, yeah. The further along production got, the more things were stripped out. Like backstories about Sonic actually being a human jet pilot and his wife is telling fairy tale stories about a hedgehog based on him. Or about him having a girlfriend named Madonna, I'm not making this up, and was in a rock group. In fact, by removing a section of the game that had this band, there was space available on the cartridge to fit in a certain audio sample. Sega, Master System. Sega! During development, society had become increasingly ecologically conscious, so the story evolved into a simple environmental one. Nature versus technology. The further you got in the game, the more present technology became, increasing the danger and challenge. So, we have a character born out of an era of pinball and arcade games with a mechanic centered around momentum. But where is the beauty? It's very simple. The whole game can be played with just one button. ONE BUTTON! This was no accident. Part of the design philosophy was to keep the controls as simple as possible. And therein lies the beauty. Simplicity. Simplicity is the key. What gives this painting meaning isn't what the artist intended. It can be anything you want. They've just presented you with an incomplete puzzle, and it is up to you how you want to complete it. And I don't mean by vandalizing it. Hey! Uh oh gotta go fast! Whoa! Stupid banana! Oh, so artistic. The whole game was made around one button, which led to jumping becoming a form of attack. It was also the most natural way of handling speed, yet still feel in control. Subsequent sequels kept this principle with the introduction of the spin dash, shield abilities, and even new friends, all controlled with a simple button. This arcade style of playing allowed for you know, fun! The designers have presented you with accessible controls and vast playgrounds, and it's up to you how you want to complete it. Future games will introduce Sonic to new mechanics and dimensions with some hit and misses. They have their merits, and this isn't me dunking on the non-2D Sonic games. I like Generations, and Sonic 06 is the gift that just keeps on giving. They're just different games that just so happen to star the same character, like the difference between Mario 3 and Mario Odyssey. But sometimes in a world of complicated and cumbersome controls, we should just remember the simplicity and grace of a game controlled with one button. And that is why Sonic is beautiful. Thank you for tuning in to my... Oh no, Sonic, I can't. I couldn't possibly. I can't resist you. <laughs> kissy, kissy. Ah, now this is art. You're too slow. I just want to give a big shout out to Amy Wright Meow for guest appearing in this episode. By the way, I specifically gave her the direction of terrible French accent, so that's that's all on me. That's all my fault. Also, thank you to Rage19 for animating those segments for me. This was a big boy video to make. So if you can and would like to, please consider supporting me on Patreon.